A racist police officer named Mark arrests an innocent black man, not realizing he's the new governor. When the truth is revealed, Mark's life is changed forever. Before we get into the story, comment below where in the world you are watching from today. And if you like this story, don't forget to subscribe. A black man in his late 50s, Joseph Thompson stood in front of his bedroom mirror, adjusting the worn baseball cap on his head. The man staring back at him was a far cry from the polished governor the public knew. Gone was the crisp suit and tie, replaced by faded jeans and a plain blue shirt. He ran a hand over his trimly clean-shaven face, feeling a mix of excitement and nervousness bubbling in his chest. This is it, he whispered to himself, his eyes filled with determination. Time to see the real state of our communities. As the newly elected governor, Joseph felt a deep responsibility to understand the true nature of safety in his state. He couldn't shake the feeling that official reports and statistics didn't tell the whole story. He needed to see it for himself, to walk in the shoes of the people he served. With a deep breath, Joseph slipped out of the governor's mansion, careful not to alert his security detail. The cool night air nipped at his skin as he made his way to a modest sedan parked a block away. As he settled into the driver's seat, he couldn't help but feel a twinge of guilt for deceiving his staff. But he knew this was necessary. Joseph's first stop was Oakwood Heights, a wealthy neighborhood known for its manicured lawns and low crime rate. As he drove through the quiet streets lined with sprawling mansions, he couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The perfectly trimmed hedges and high fences seemed more like barriers than decorations. Parking his car near a small park, Joseph stepped out and began to walk. The streetlights cast a warm glow on the sidewalk, and the only sound was the gentle rustle of leaves in the breeze. It was peaceful almost too peaceful. As he strolled, Joseph's mind wandered to the stark contrast between this neighborhood and the one he grew up in. He remembered the sounds of laughter and music spilling out of open windows, the smell of different cuisines wafting through the air. Here, everything seemed closed off, isolated. Joseph continued his late-night stroll through Oakwood Heights, his eyes carefully scanning the surroundings. The streetlights cast long shadows across the perfectly manicured lawns, creating an eerie contrast between light and dark. He noticed that while the main roads were well lit, some of the side streets seemed dimmer, almost forgotten. As he turned onto one of these darker streets, Joseph felt a chill run down his spine. The shadows seemed to deepen, and he couldn't help but think about how vulnerable someone might feel walking here alone. He made a mental note to look into improving lighting in these areas. Joseph's footsteps echoed softly on the pavement, the only sound in the otherwise silent night. He knew the risk of being out here like this, but it was a necessary part of his plan. He needed to experience the neighborhood as anyone else might. No security detail, no official vehicle, just a man on the street. Officer Mark Tanner cruised through the quiet streets of Oakwood Heights, his eyes scanning the area with practiced vigilance. After 20 years on the force, he knew this neighborhood like the back of his hand. The manicured lawns and stately homes were a far cry from the rough areas he'd patrolled in his early days. Nothing ever happens in this part of area, but that's what makes it so easy to miss something, Mark said. As Mark turned onto Maple Avenue, something caught his eye. His headlights caught a lone figure walking slowly down the sidewalk. A figure was walking slowly down the sidewalk, hands in pockets, head slightly bowed. The man's dark clothing and casual stride seemed out of place among the pristine surroundings. Mark's instincts kicked in, the hairs on the back of his neck standing up as suspicion settled in his gut. Mark's brow furrowed. It was nearly midnight and this wasn't the kind of neighborhood where people took casual strolls at this hour. He slowed the cruiser, studying the man more closely. The stranger's clothes were plain, nothing like the designer outfits the residents here usually wore. Mark's suspicion grew. Years of experience had taught him to trust his gut, and right now his instincts were screaming that something wasn't right. Mark watched Joseph from the safety of his patrol car, his eyes narrowing with each pass the stranger made. The man's casual clothes and repeated pacing set off alarm bells in Mark's mind. He'd seen this before, people casing houses looking for an easy mark. Not on my watch, 
Mark muttered, his jaw clenching. Years of experience had taught Mark to trust his gut, and right now, his instincts were screaming danger. He couldn't shake the feeling that this man was up to no good. The peaceful neighborhood, with its manicured lawns and expensive homes, seemed to stand in stark contrast to the shabby-looking figure on the sidewalk. Mark's mind raced with possibilities. Was this guy planning a break-in? Maybe he was part of a gang, scouting the area for future targets. The more Mark thought about it, the more convinced he became that he needed to act fast. His heart pounded as he made his decision. He wouldn't let this neighborhood fall victim to crime, not while he was on duty. Mark's hand instinctively moved to his holster as he stepped out of the car, his face set in a grim expression. Time to put an end to this, he said to himself, striding purposefully towards Joseph. As he approached, Mark's posture became more aggressive, his steps more determined. He was ready to confront this suspicious character and put a stop to whatever he was planning. The weight of his badge and the responsibility it carried fueled his resolve. Mark strode towards Joseph, his hand resting on his holster. The streetlights cast long shadows across the quiet neighborhood as he approached the stranger. Hey you, Mark barked, his voice echoing in the still night air. What do you think you're doing out here at this hour? Joseph turned calmly facing the officer with a composed expression. Good evening, officer, he said softly. I'm just taking a walk and observing the area. Mark's eyes narrowed, suspicion etched across his face. A walk? At this time of night? In this neighborhood? I don't think so. Let's see some ID. Joseph reached slowly into his pocket, maintaining eye contact with Mark. Of course, officer. I understand your concern. I'm actually here to assess the safety of the area. Mark scoffed, his tone growing more hostile. Safety assessment? That's a new one. I know your type. As Joseph produced his ID, Mark snatched it from his hand, barely glancing at it before tossing it back. This doesn't explain why you're really here. I've been watching you pace up and down this street. You're casing these houses, aren't you? Joseph took a deep breath, trying to keep his voice level. Officer, I assure you, that's not the case. If you'll just listen... Listen, Mark interrupted, his voice rising. I've heard enough lies in my time on the force. You think I don't know what's really going on here? Joseph attempted once more to explain. Sir, if you'd just allow me to clarify. But Mark wasn't interested in explanations. His face flushed with anger as he cut Joseph off again. Save it. I know your type. You come into nice neighborhoods like this, thinking you can take advantage of honest, hardworking people. Well, not on my watch. Mark's aggressive stance and hostile tone created a tense atmosphere. Joseph remained calm, but he could see that the officer wasn't willing to hear him out. The situation was escalating quickly, and Joseph realized that his attempt to quietly assess the neighborhood's safety had taken an unexpected and dangerous turn. Joseph took a deep breath, trying to maintain his composure. He knew he needed to defuse the situation before it got worse. Officer, I understand your concern, he said gently. But I can assure you, I'm not here to cause any trouble. I'm actually conducting a personal safety inspection of the neighborhood. Mark's face twisted with disbelief. A personal safety inspection? At this hour? Do you really expect me to buy that? His hand tightened on his holster, his body language becoming more aggressive. It's the truth, Joseph insisted, keeping his voice calm and steady. I'm trying to assess the safety of different areas in our community. I chose to do it at night to get a better understanding of potential risks after dark. But Mark's bias had already taken hold. He shook his head, his eyes narrowing. Nice try, buddy. I've heard every excuse in the book. You're just making up stories to cover your tracks. Joseph could see the anger and suspicion growing in Mark's eyes. He realized with a sinking feeling that the officer wasn't willing to listen to reason. The tension in the air was palpable, like a tightly coiled spring ready to snap. Officer, please, Joseph tried once more, his voice tinged with urgency. If you'd just allow me to explain... Explain what? Mark cut him off, his voice rising. How you're casing these houses? Planning your next break-in? I've dealt with guys like you before. Always have a story? Always have an excuse? 
Joseph felt a wave of frustration wash over him. He had hoped that by being calm and honest, he could make the officer understand. But it was becoming clear that Mark's prejudice was blinding him to the truth. Sir, I assure you that's not the case, Joseph said, fighting to keep his voice steady. I'm simply trying to do my job and ensure the safety of our community. Mark took a step closer, his face red with anger. Your job? Don't make me laugh. The only job you have is causing trouble. Now, you're going to come with me to the station, and we'll sort this out there. As Mark reached for his handcuffs, Joseph realized that the situation had spiraled far beyond what he had ever imagined. His simple attempt to assess neighborhood safety had turned into a dangerous confrontation, all because of one officer's unwillingness to see past his own biases. Despite Joseph's continued attempts to clarify the situation, Mark's suspicions only deepened. The officer's face hardened, his eyes narrowing with distrust. Joseph's calm demeanor, rather than easing Mark's concerns, only served to fuel his suspicions. You're awfully cool for someone caught red-handed, Mark growled, his voice dripping with accusation. I've seen your type before. Smooth talkers, thinking they can manipulate their way out of anything. Joseph opened his mouth to protest once more, but Mark had already made up his mind. Without further questioning, the officer reached for his handcuffs. That's enough out of you. You're under arrest. Joseph's heart sank as he realized the gravity of the situation. He had never imagined his well-intentioned safety assessment would lead to this. As Mark roughly grabbed his wrists and slapped the cold metal cuffs around them, Joseph made a conscious decision to remain calm and cooperative. Please, officer, Joseph said softly as Mark tightened the handcuffs. I understand you're doing your job, but there's been a misunderstanding. Mark ignored Joseph's words, forcefully guiding him towards the pedal car. Save it for the station, he snapped, his grip on Joseph's arm unnecessarily tight. As they walked, Joseph could feel the eyes of curious neighbors peeking out from behind curtains. The peaceful night had been shattered by this confrontation, and he felt a pang of regret for the disturbance he had inadvertently caused. Mark roughly shoved Joseph into the back of the patrol car, slamming the door shut with more force than necessary. As he climbed into the driver's seat, Joseph caught a glimpse of the officer's face in the rearview mirror. It was a mask of grim satisfaction, completely unaware of the grave mistake he was making. Mark started the engine, his eyes darting to the rearview mirror to check on his suspect. Joseph sat quietly in the back, his face a mask of calm resignation. The officer's jaw clenched as he pulled away from the curb, still convinced he had caught a criminal red-handed. As they drove through the quiet streets, Mark couldn't help but feel a sense of pride. He'd protected the neighborhood from what he was sure was a potential threat. You picked the wrong area to case, buddy, he said, his voice gruff with satisfaction. Joseph remained silent, his eyes fixed on the passing streetlights. He had decided not to reveal his identity just yet, knowing it would only complicate matters further. Instead, he used the time to gather his thoughts and prepare for what lay ahead. Mark, interpreting Joseph's silence as guilt, continued his lecture. You criminals think you're so smart, but you can't fool me. I've been doing this job for years. I know trouble when I see it. The ride to the station felt longer than it was, the tension in the car growing with each passing minute. When they finally arrived, Mark roughly pulled Joseph from the back seat, his grip unnecessarily tight on Joseph's arm. As they entered the station, the bustling activity inside came to a momentary halt. Officers looked up from their desks, curious about the new arrival. Mark marched Joseph towards the booking area, a triumphant look on his face. Got a suspicious character loitering in Oakwood, Mark announced to his colleagues, pushing Joseph forward. Caught him red-handed, casing the neighborhood. The other officers gathered around, their eyes moving from Mark to Joseph. Some nodded approvingly at Mark's catch while others seemed more hesitant, noting Joseph's calm demeanor and well-kept appearance. One of the younger officers, a rookie named Sarah, stepped forward. Did he resist arrest? She asked, her voice tinged with concern. Nah, Mark replied. But that doesn't mean he's innocent. These smooth talkers are the worst kind. Think they can talk their way out of anything. As Joseph was led to the booking desk, he could feel the weight of the officer's stares. 
The situation was tense, the air thick with unspoken questions and assumptions. He knew that soon, the truth would come to light, and he wondered how Mark and the others would react when they realized their mistake. As Mark led Joseph to the booking area, the atmosphere in the station remained tense. The veteran officer's face was set in a grim expression, his eyes narrowed with suspicion. Joseph, on the other hand, maintained his composure, his calm demeanor a stark contrast to Mark's agitation. Name? Mark demanded gruffly, pen poised over the booking form. Joseph hesitated for a moment before responding softly. Joseph Thompson. Mark scribbled down the name, not realizing its significance. He continued with the standard questions, his tone brusque and impatient. Joseph answered each query truthfully, his voice steady and clear. As the booking process dragged on, other officers in the station cast curious glances their way. The contrast between Mark's aggressive attitude and Joseph's quiet dignity was hard to ignore. Meanwhile, in his office, Police Chief Davis was settling in for what he thought would be a quiet night shift. The phone on his desk rang, piercing the silence. He picked it up, his brow furrowing as he listened to the voice on the other end. Chief Davis speaking, he said, his voice gruff from lack of use. The caller's words made the chief sit up straight, his eyes widening in alarm. The governor is doing what? He asked, his voice rising in disbelief. As the caller explained the situation, Chief Davis felt a knot forming in his stomach. Governor Thompson was conducting an undercover safety assessment in the area. The chief's mind raced, trying to recall if any of his officers had reported anything unusual. Thank you for the heads up, Chief Davis said, his voice tight with worry. We'll keep an eye out. As he hung up the phone, the chief's gaze drifted to the booking area. He could see Mark processing a man who didn't look like their usual suspects. A terrible thought began to form in his mind. Chief Davis stood up abruptly, his chair scraping against the floor. He walked briskly towards the booking area, his heart pounding with each step. As he approached, he could hear Mark's gruff voice and the calm responses of the man being booked. The chief's alarm bells were ringing loudly now. He quickened his pace, hoping against hope that his suspicions were wrong. But as he drew closer, he could see the face of the man Mark was booking. His stomach dropped. It was Governor Joseph Thompson. Chief Davis burst into the booking area, his face flushed with panic, his eyes immediately locked onto Joseph, who stood calmly in handcuffs beside Mark. The chief's worst fears were confirmed in an instant. Oh my God, Chief Davis gasped, his voice barely above a whisper. Release him, release him now. Mark turned, startled by the chief's sudden appearance and urgent tone. Sir, he asked, confusion evident in his voice. The chief rushed forward, fumbling with the keys to remove Joseph's handcuffs himself. This is Governor Joseph Thompson, he explained, his voice trembling with a mix of fear and respect. Mark's face drained of color. His mouth fell open as he stared at Joseph in disbelief. The pen he had been holding clattered to the floor, the sound echoing in the now silent room. Governor? Mark stammered, his eyes wide with shock. But... I thought... Joseph rubbed his wrists gently as the handcuffs fell away. He looked at Mark with a mixture of understanding and disappointment. It's all right, Chief, he said softly. I chose not to reveal my identity earlier. The atmosphere in the station shifted dramatically. Officers who had been pretending not to watch now openly stared, their faces a mix of surprise and embarrassment. The realization of what had just transpired slowly sank in, leaving everyone in a state of stunned silence. Chief Davis turned to face his officers, his face grave. Everyone, this is Governor Joseph Thompson. He was conducting an undercover safety assessment of our community when this unfortunate incident occurred. Mark stood rooted to the spot, his face a mask of horror as the full weight of his actions crashed down upon him. He had arrested the governor, the very man he had sworn to serve and protect. Governor Thompson... Mark began, his voice cracking with emotion. I... I don't know what to say. I'm so sorry. I never meant to... Joseph held up a hand, silencing Mark's stammered apology. The governor's eyes were filled with a mix of sadness and determination. The room held its breath, waiting to see how he would respond to this monumental mistake. Mark stood frozen, 
his face a mask of shame and disbelief. The weight of his actions crashed down upon him like a tidal wave, leaving him speechless. He had arrested the governor, the very man he had sworn to protect and serve. The realization was almost too much to bear. The other officers in the station were equally stunned. Some stared open-mouthed at the scene unfolding before them, while others averted their eyes unable to witness Mark's humiliation. The air in the room felt thick with tension and embarrassment. Chief Davis, his face flushed with anger and frustration, turned to Mark. Officer Tanner, he said, his voice trembling with barely contained fury. How in the world did this happen? What were you thinking? Mark opened his mouth to respond, but no words came out. He felt small, exposed, and utterly foolish. His usual confidence and authority had evaporated, leaving behind a shell of a man who was only now beginning to comprehend the enormity of his mistake. I... I thought... Mark stammered, his voice barely above a whisper. He looked around the room, desperately seeking understanding or support from his fellow officers, but found only shock and disappointment in their eyes. The chief's gaze bore into Mark, demanding an explanation. You thought what, Officer Tanner? That you could just arrest someone without proper cause? Without even listening to their explanation? Mark's arrogance, which had always been a part of his demeanor, began to crumble. He felt the foundations of his beliefs shaking, threatening to collapse entirely. The certainty he had felt earlier in the night now seemed like a distant memory, replaced by a growing sense of doubt and self-reflection. I made a terrible mistake, Mark finally managed to say, his voice cracking with emotion. I let my assumptions and, and my biases cloud my judgment. I didn't listen. I didn't give the gov. Mr. Thompson a chance to explain. As the words left his mouth, Mark felt a wave of realization wash over him. He had always prided himself on being a good cop, on protecting the community. But now, faced with the consequences of his actions, he began to see how his prejudices had led him astray. Joseph, despite the ordeal he had just endured, remained remarkably composed. His calm demeanor seemed to fill the room, easing some of the tension that hung thick in the air. He turned to Chief Davis, his eyes reflecting a mix of understanding and determination. Chief, Joseph said, his voice steady and reassuring, I want you to know that I'm not angry about what's happened here tonight. However, I would like to have a private conversation with Officer Tanner, if that's all right. Chief Davis looked surprised, his eyebrows shooting up. He glanced nervously between Joseph and Mark, clearly uncertain about the request. Governor, are you sure? After what just happened, I don't think... Joseph raised a hand, gently cutting off the chief's protests. I'm sure, Chief. I believe it's necessary. Reluctantly, Chief Davis nodded. All right, Governor. You can use my office. It's just down the hall, first door on the right. As Joseph made his way towards the office, Mark felt his heart pounding in his chest. His palms were sweaty, and he could feel a lump forming in his throat. The walk to the office seemed to take an eternity, each step feeling heavier than the last. Once inside, Joseph closed the door behind them, the soft click echoing in Mark's ears like a thunderclap. Mark stood rigidly, his back straight and his eyes fixed on a point just over Joseph's shoulder. He couldn't bring himself to meet the governor's gaze. Officer Tanner, Joseph began, his voice surprisingly gentle. Please have a seat. Mark hesitated for a moment before slowly lowering himself into one of the chairs. He was terrified of what the governor might say. In his mind, he ran through all the possible outcomes, being fired, facing legal action, or worse. He braced himself for the worst, expecting the full weight of the governor's authority to come crashing down on him. Joseph took the seat across from Mark, leaning forward slightly. His eyes, filled with a mix of concern and compassion, searched Mark's face. The silence stretched between them and Mark felt as if he might break under the pressure of it. Joseph leaned back in his chair, his eyes fixed on Mark with a mixture of concern and understanding. The tension in the room was palpable, but Joseph's calm demeanor seemed to soften it slightly. Officer Tanner, Joseph began, his voice gentle but firm. I want to talk to you about what happened tonight. Not as the governor, but as a fellow human being. Mark swallowed hard, his eyes still fixed on the floor. He couldn't bring himself to look at Joseph, shame and fear coursing through his veins. Joseph continued, When you saw me tonight, what was your first thought? What made you suspect me? 
Mark's voice was barely above a whisper when he finally spoke. You looked... out of place, sir. I thought you might be up to something. Joseph nodded slowly. And why did I look out of place to you? Mark fell silent, the realization of his own biases beginning to dawn on him. Joseph pressed on, his voice filled with empathy. Officer Tanner, what happened tonight is a clear example of racial profiling. It's a dangerous practice that causes real harm to innocent people. I was there to assess the safety of our community, to understand how we can make it better for everyone. Instead, I experienced firsthand the very thing that makes so many of our citizens feel unsafe. Mark felt a lump forming in his throat. He had always prided himself on being a good cop, on protecting people. But now, faced with the consequences of his actions, he began to see the flaws in his thinking. Joseph leaned forward, his eyes searching Mark's face. This isn't just about me, Mark. Think about how many other innocent people might have been treated unfairly because of snap judgments based on appearance. The harm this causes runs deep in our communities. As Joseph's words sank in, Mark felt a wave of emotions wash over him. Guilt, shame, and a dawning realization of the impact of his actions. For the first time since entering the room, he looked up, meeting Joseph's gaze. Joseph leaned forward, his eyes filled with compassion. Mark, every person deserves to be treated with dignity and respect, no matter what they look like or where they come from. It's not just about following rules, it's about seeing the humanity in everyone we meet. Mark nodded slowly, his shoulders slumping as the weight of Joseph's words sank in. Let me share something with you, Joseph continued. When I was younger, I had a friend named Michael. He was one of the kindest people I've ever known, but because of the color of his skin, he was often treated with suspicion. One day we were walking home from school and a police officer stopped us. The officer questioned Michael aggressively while barely glancing at me. I saw the pain and fear in Michael's eyes that day, and it's something I've never forgotten. Mark's eyes widened, a flicker of recognition passing across his face. He had been that officer so many times before, never stopping to consider the impact of his actions. Joseph went on, his voice gentle but firm. And it's not just personal experiences. I've heard countless stories from people in our community. A mother who was followed around a store because the staff thought she might steal. A father who was pulled over for no reason other than driving an expensive car. A teenager who was harassed while simply walking home. These incidents may seem small to some, but they add up. They create a world where people feel unwelcome and unsafe in their own communities. As Joseph spoke, Mark felt a growing sense of shame. He had always justified his actions as necessary for keeping the peace, but now he was beginning to see the harm he had caused. Officer Tanner, Joseph said, leaning in closer. I want you to understand that these biases, whether we're aware of them or not, can have devastating consequences. They erode trust between law enforcement and the community. They make people feel like they don't belong. And in some cases, they can even lead to tragedy. Mark's eyes began to water as the full impact of his actions hit him. He thought about all the times he had acted on his prejudices, all the people he might have hurt without even realizing it. Joseph noticed Mark's reaction and softened his tone. But Mark, recognizing these biases is the first step towards change. It's not about blame. It's about growth. We all have the capacity to learn, to do better. Joseph took a deep breath, his eyes filled with determination and compassion. He leaned forward, placing a gentle hand on Mark's shoulder. Officer Tanner, he said softly, I'm not here to punish you or to make you feel worse than you already do. I believe in second chances and the power of growth. Mark looked up, his eyes wide with surprise. He had expected anger, maybe even threats to his job, but the governor's kindness caught him off guard. I want to offer you an opportunity, Joseph continued. We're starting a new state initiative to improve relations between the police and our communities. It's all about building empathy and understanding. I think you'd be a perfect candidate for this program. Mark's mouth fell open. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. But after what I did, why would you want me involved? Joseph smiled warmly. 
because you've seen firsthand how harmful biases can be. Your experience tonight could be a powerful lesson for others, and I believe you have the courage to admit your mistakes and work to become better. Tears welled up in Mark's eyes. He had never expected such forgiveness, such grace. It touched something deep inside him, a part of his heart he hadn't realized was there. Governor Thompson, I... I don't know what to say, Mark stammered. Thank you. I promise I'll do everything I can to make things right. Joseph nodded, his smile growing wider. That's all I ask, Mark. We all have room to grow and learn. This program will give you the tools to do just that. As Mark listened to the details of the initiative, he felt a spark of hope ignite within him. For the first time in years, he saw a chance to become the kind of officer he had always dreamed of being, one who truly served and protected all members of his community. The police chief entered the room, his face a mix of concern and curiosity. Joseph quickly filled him in on the proposal he had just made to Mark. The chief listened intently, his brow furrowed in thought. Governor, the chief said, I appreciate your willingness to turn this unfortunate incident into a learning opportunity. But are you sure about this? Joseph nodded confidently. I am, Chief. I believe Officer Tanner has the potential to become a great asset to this initiative. His experience tonight could be invaluable in helping other officers recognize and overcome their own biases. The Chief considered Joseph's words carefully. He looked at Mark, who sat quietly, his eyes fixed on the floor. After a moment of silence, the chief spoke again. All right, Governor. If you think this is the best course of action, I'll support it. Officer Tanner, are you willing to participate in this program? Mark looked up, his face a canvas of conflicting emotions. He glanced from the chief to Joseph, then back again. I... I'm not sure I'm the right person for this, he said hesitantly. What if I can't change? Joseph leaned forward, his eyes filled with compassion. Mark, the fact that you're worried about that shows you're already changing. It's okay to have doubts, but don't let them stop you from trying. Mark took a deep breath, his shoulders sagging slightly. He knew this was his chance to make things right, to become a better officer and a better person. But the task ahead seemed daunting. Okay, Mark said finally, his voice barely above a whisper. I'll do it. I owe it to you, Governor, and to everyone I've wronged because of my biases. I just hope I can live up to your expectations. Joseph smiled warmly. It's not about meeting my expectations, Mark. It's about becoming the best version of yourself. And I believe you can do it. As the details of the program were discussed, Mark listened attentively, though his mind was racing with doubts and fears. He wondered if he could truly change years of ingrained behavior and thinking. But deep down, a small spark of hope had been ignited. Maybe, just maybe, this was his path to redemption. The following week, Mark found himself sitting in a brightly lit conference room, surrounded by other officers from various precincts. The air was thick with tension and unisi. At the front of the room stood Dr. Angela Chen a respected psychologist and expert on unconscious bias. Welcome, everyone, Dr. Chen began, her voice warm but firm. We're here today to talk about something that affects us all, unconscious bias. Mark shifted uncomfortably in his seat. He could feel his defenses rising, but he forced himself to stay open-minded. He had made a promise, after all. As Dr. Chen delved into the science behind unconscious bias, Mark found himself struggling to accept some of the concepts. She explained how our brains make quick judgments based on past experiences and societal influences, often without us even realizing it. These biases can affect our actions even when we think we're being fair, Dr. Chen said, looking around the room. Her gaze seemed to linger on Mark for a moment, and he felt a twinge of guilt. The workshop moved on to interactive exercises. In one activity, Officers were shown pictures of various individuals and asked to write down their first impressions. Mark was shocked to realize how quickly he had made assumptions based solely on appearance. As the day progressed, Mark found himself becoming more engaged, 
He listened intently as community leaders shared their experiences of being unfairly targeted due to bias. Their stories hit close to home, reminding him of his encounter with Governor Joseph. During a group discussion, Mark hesitantly raised his hand. I, I never realized how much these biases were affecting my work, he admitted, his voice slightly shaky. How do we start to change something that's so ingrained? Dr. Chen smiled encouragingly. Recognizing the problem is the first step, Officer Tanner. It takes time and conscious effort, but change is possible. As the workshop came to a close, Mark felt a mix of emotions. He was overwhelmed by the realization of how deeply his biases ran, but he also felt a glimmer of hope. For the first time, he truly understood the importance of this training. As the training progressed, Mark found himself thrust into increasingly challenging role-playing scenarios. Each one was designed to put him in the shoes of those he had unfairly judged in the past. At first, he felt awkward and resistant, but as he immersed himself in the exercises, something began to shift within him. In one scenario, Mark had to play the role of a young black man being stopped by the police for no apparent reason. As he acted out the scene, he felt a knot forming in his stomach. The fear and frustration he was meant to portray suddenly felt all too real. How can I help you, officer? Mark asked, his voice trembling slightly as he tried to embody the character. And the officer playing his counterpart approached with the same authoritative stance Mark had used countless times before. You match the description of a suspect we're looking for. I'm going to need to see some ID. As the scene unfolded, Mark felt a wave of emotions he had never experienced before. The helplessness, the anger, the humiliation, it all crashed over him like a tidal wave. For the first time, he truly understood the impact of his actions on the people he had stopped and questioned over the years. After the exercise, the group gathered to discuss their experiences. Mark's voice was hoarse with emotion as he spoke. I... I never realized how it felt to be on the other side, he admitted. The fear, the powerlessness, it's overwhelming. Dr. Chen nodded encouragingly. That's exactly the point of these exercises, Officer Tanner. They're meant to build empathy and understanding. As the days went by, Mark participated in more scenarios. He played the role of a Hispanic teenager being followed in a store, an elderly Asian woman being ignored when reporting a crime, and a Middle Eastern man being harassed at an airport. Each experience chipped away at the walls of prejudice he had built over the years. One evening, as Mark drove home from the training, he found himself reflecting on his career. He thought about all the times he had acted on his biases, all the people he might have hurt. The weight of his realizations was heavy, but for the first time he felt a genuine desire to change. As the training progressed, Mark found himself sitting in a circle with community leaders from various backgrounds. The room was filled with a mix of tension and hope, as each person prepared to share their experiences. The first to speak was Maria, a middle-aged Latina woman. Her eyes glistened with unshed tears as she recounted her encounter with law enforcement. I was just walking home from work, she said softly. But the officer who stopped me, he treated me like I was a criminal, like I didn't belong in my own neighborhood. Mark felt a pang in his chest. He had stopped people for similar reasons countless times before. As Maria continued her story, he found himself hanging on every word, seeing the incident through her eyes for the first time. Next was James, a young black man barely out of his teens. His voice shook as he described being pulled over for a routine traffic stop that quickly escalated. I was so scared, James admitted. I did everything right, but the officer kept getting angrier. I thought I might not make it home that night. Mark's stomach churned. He recognized the aggressive tactics James described. He had used them himself, convinced he was doing his job. Now hearing the fear and pain in James's voice, Mark felt a deep sense of shame washing over him. As more stories poured out, Mark found himself overwhelmed with emotion. He heard about missed job opportunities due to racial profiling, children afraid to play outside because of police presence, and families torn apart by biased arrests. Each tale was a stark reminder of the harm his actions had caused. During a break, Mark stepped outside for some air. His mind was reeling from all he had heard. He looked up at the sky, blinking back tears. 
For the first time in his career, he truly understood the weight of his badge and the responsibility it carried. When the session resumed, Mark listened with newfound empathy. He began to see each speaker not as a potential threat or a stereotype, but as a human being with hopes, fears, and dreams. The world he had known for so long was shifting, and though it was uncomfortable, Mark knew it was necessary. As the day drew to a close, Mark approached Maria. His voice was thick with emotion as he spoke. I, I want to thank you for sharing your story, he said. I know it couldn't have been easy. I'm sorry for what you went through, and I promise I'm going to do better. Maria's eyes widened in surprise, then softened with understanding. She reached out and squeezed Mark's hand gently. That's all we can ask for, she said with a small smile. That you listen, understand, and try to change. As the final day of training drew to a close, Mark sat quietly in his chair, his mind swirling with all he had learned. The weight of his past actions pressed heavily on his shoulders, but alongside it was a new feeling, hope. He knew he had a long way to go, but for the first time, he felt truly committed to change. With a deep breath, Mark stood up and made his way over to where Joseph was chatting with some of the community leaders. As he approached, Joseph turned to him with a warm smile. Officer Tanner, Joseph said, extending his hand. How are you feeling? Mark took Joseph's hand, his grip firm but his eyes filled with emotion. Governor, I... I don't even know where to begin, he said, his voice thick. These past few days have opened my eyes in ways I never thought possible. Joseph nodded encouragingly, giving Mark the space to continue. I want to thank you, Mark went on, his words coming faster now. Not just for this opportunity, but for your forgiveness that night. I was so wrong and you showed me kindness I didn't deserve. Joseph's eyes softened. We all deserve the chance to learn and grow, Mark, he said gently. Mark nodded, blinking back tears. I feel like I'm seeing the world clearly for the first time, he admitted. And I know I have a lot of work to do to make things right. But I'm committed to doing it, no matter how hard it gets. Joseph placed a hand on Mark's shoulder, his touch reassuring. That's all anyone can ask, Mark. The road ahead won't be easy, but you won't be walking it alone. Mark looked up, surprise evident in his eyes. You mean... Joseph smiled warmly. I'll be here to support you, Mark. We're all in this together, working towards a better, more just community. Mark's transformation had ignited a fire within him. As he stepped into his new role as a leader in the state initiative, he felt a sense of purpose he had never experienced before. The weight of his past mistakes still lingered, but it now fueled his determination to make a difference. On a bright Monday morning, Mark stood before a group of fellow officers in the precinct's conference room. His hands trembled slightly as he adjusted his uniform, but his voice was steady when he spoke. I have been where many of you are now, he began, his eyes meeting those of his colleagues. I thought I was doing my job protecting our community, but I was wrong. My biases were hurting the very people we swore to serve. The room fell silent, all eyes fixed on Mark. He took a deep breath and continued. I'm here to tell you that change is possible. It's not easy, but it's necessary and I'm asking each of you to join me on this journey. As Mark shared his experiences from the training, he could see the impact his words were having. Some officers shifted uncomfortably in their seats, while others nodded in understanding. He spoke of the role-playing exercises, the eye-opening discussions with community leaders, and the profound realizations he had made about himself. This isn't just about following new rules, Mark emphasized, his voice filled with passion. It's about truly seeing the people we serve, understanding their experiences, and building trust within our community. Over the next few weeks, Mark threw himself into his new role. He worked tirelessly, organizing workshops and facilitating discussions between officers and community members. His enthusiasm was contagious, and slowly but surely, more officers began to sign up for the training program. One afternoon, as Mark was preparing materials for an upcoming session, Officer Sarah Santos approached him. I've been watching you, Tanner, she said, her expression thoughtful. You've really changed. 
I wasn't sure about all this at first, but seeing how it's affected you, well, I think I'm ready to give it a try. Mark felt a surge of hope. That's great, Sarah, he said warmly. I promise you, it'll be challenging, but it's worth it. We can make a real difference here. As more officers joined the initiative, Mark could feel a shift happening within the department. Conversations were changing, attitudes were evolving, and a new sense of understanding was beginning to take root. Joseph and Mark stood side by side at the front of a crowded community center. The room buzzed with a mix of excitement and nervousness as police officers and local residents filed in, taking their seats. This was the first of many community meetings they had planned across the state, and both men felt the weight of its importance. Joseph stepped forward, his calm presence immediately drawing everyone's attention. Welcome, everyone, he said warmly. We're here today to start a conversation to build bridges and to create a safer, more understanding community for all of us. Mark nodded in agreement, his eyes scanning the room. He could see the apprehension on some faces, the hope on others. Taking a deep breath, he addressed the crowd. I know there's been a lot of distrust between law enforcement and the community. I've been part of the problem, but today we're taking a step towards being part of the solution. As the meeting progressed, Joseph and Mark facilitated discussions between officers and residents. They broke the large group into smaller circles, encouraging open and honest dialogue. At first, the conversations were stilted, with both sides hesitant to share. But as time went on, stories began to flow, and understanding started to grow. In one corner, an elderly woman shared her fear of calling the police, even when she needed help. A young officer listened intently, his face a mixture of surprise and concern. In another group, a teenager spoke about feeling targeted because of his race, while a veteran officer opened up about the pressures and fears he faced on the job. Joseph moved from group to group, offering words of encouragement and guidance. He could see the seeds of change being planted, and it filled him with hope. Mark, too, was deeply moved by the conversations he witnessed. He saw his fellow officers beginning to understand the impact of their actions in a way they never had before. As the weeks passed, Joseph and Mark took their initiative on the road, visiting police departments and communities across the state. They organized workshops where officers could confront their biases and learn new ways of interacting with the public. Community leaders were invited to share their perspectives, helping to humanize the experiences of those who had long felt marginalized. The program gained momentum with each passing day. Police departments began implementing new training protocols based on Joseph and Mark's initiative. Community members reported feeling more comfortable approaching officers, and officers found themselves better equipped to handle diverse situations. Mark sat in his living room, his hands clasped tightly as he stared at the phone on the coffee table. The weight of his past actions pressed heavily on his conscience. He knew it was time to face those he had wronged and try to make things right. With a deep breath, he picked up the phone and dialed a number he had looked up earlier. His heart raced as he waited for someone to answer. Hello? A hesitant voice came through the speaker. Mr. Johnson? Mark's voice wavered slightly. This is Officer Mark Tanner. I... I wanted to speak with you about an incident that happened last year. There was a long pause on the other end. Mark could almost feel the tension through the phone. I remember you, Mr. Johnson finally replied, his tone guarded. Mark swallowed hard. Sir, I wanted to apologize for how I treated you that day. I was wrong, and I'm truly sorry for the pain I caused you and your family. The silence that followed felt like an eternity to Mark. He waited, his heart pounding in his chest. I appreciate your call, Officer Tanner. Mr. Johnson said slowly, but it's going to take more than words to heal the hurt you caused. Mark nodded, even though Mr. Johnson couldn't see him. I understand, sir. I'm committed to doing better and making real changes. Is there anything I can do to make amends? They talked for a while longer, with Mark listening intently to Mr. Johnson's experiences and suggestions. By the end of the call, while things weren't fully resolved, a small bridge had been built. Over the next few weeks, Mark continued reaching out to others he had mistreated in the past. Some conversations were difficult, 
with people expressing anger and distrust. Others were more open to his efforts at reconciliation. Each call, each meeting was a step in Mark's journey of redemption. One afternoon, Mark met with a young man named Tyrell at a local coffee shop. Tyrell had been wrongfully arrested by Mark two years ago, and the memory of that day still haunted them both. As the initiative gained momentum, its success began to catch the eye of local media outlets. Soon, reporters were knocking on doors, eager to share the story of transformation and hope that was unfolding in their state. One sunny morning, Mark found himself sitting in a brightly lit studio, facing a friendly news anchor. The camera's red light blinked on, and Mark took a deep breath. Officer Mark Tanner, thank you for joining us today. The anchor began with a warm smile. Your story has captured the attention of many. Can you tell us about your journey? Mark nodded, his eyes reflecting a mix of humility and determination. It's been a challenging but rewarding path, he said, his voice steady. I had to confront my own biases and the harm they caused. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. The interview continued with Mark openly sharing his experiences and the lessons he had learned. He spoke about the importance of empathy and understanding, his voice filled with genuine emotion. In another interview, Governor Joseph Thompson sat across from a different reporter, his calm demeanor radiating wisdom and compassion. Governor, what inspired you to offer Officer Tanner this opportunity for redemption? The reporter asked. Joseph leaned forward slightly, his eyes twinkling. I believe in the power of second chances, he replied. Mark's willingness to change and grow is a testament to the human capacity for transformation. It's a reminder that forgiveness can be a powerful tool for positive change. As these interviews aired, people across the state found themselves moved by the story of redemption and hope. In living rooms, coffee shops, and community centers, conversations sparked about bias, forgiveness, and the possibility of change. One evening, a local community group in a small town gathered to watch a special report on the initiative. As Mark's face appeared on the screen, recounting his journey, the room fell silent. I never thought I'd see the day, whispered an elderly woman, tears glistening in her eyes. Maybe there's hope for us all. The story resonated deeply with people from all walks of life. It inspired them to look within themselves, to question their own biases, and to take action in their communities. As Mark patrolled the same upscale neighborhood where he had first encountered Joseph, he noticed a figure walking slowly along the sidewalk. The person seemed to be studying the houses intently, occasionally stopping to jot something down in a small notebook. Mark felt a familiar twinge of suspicion, but this time he took a deep breath and remembered his training. Instead of immediately confronting the individual, Mark pulled his patrol car to the curb and stepped out calmly. He approached the person with a friendly demeanor, his hand relaxed at his side rather than near his weapon. Good evening, Mark called out, his voice warm and unthreatening. I'm Officer Tanner. I noticed you seem to be taking a lot of interest in the houses around here. Mind if I ask what you're up to? The figure turned, revealing a young woman with a startled expression. She clutched her notebook tightly, her eyes darting nervously between Mark and the ground. I... I'm sorry she stammered. I'm an architecture student. I'm studying the designs of these houses for a project. Mark nodded, his face open and attentive. That sounds interesting. Would you mind telling me more about your project? I'd love to hear about it. The woman's shoulders relaxed slightly and she began to explain her assignment. As she spoke, Mark listened intently, asking thoughtful questions about her studies and the architectural features she found fascinating. That's really impressive. Mark said sincerely when she finished. I never realized how much thought goes into designing these homes. Thank you for sharing that with me. The woman smiled, her earlier nervousness completely gone. Thank you for listening, Officer Tanner. I was worried you might think I was up to something suspicious. Mark chuckled softly. Well, I'm glad we had the chance to talk. It's my job to keep this neighborhood safe but it's also important to understand what's really going on. Would you like me to walk with you for a bit? I'd be happy to point out some other interesting houses in the area. The woman nodded enthusiastically, 
and they began to stroll down the sidewalk together, engaged in friendly conversation. As they walked, Mark felt a sense of pride and accomplishment. He had approached the situation with empathy and understanding, and the result was a positive interaction that left both parties feeling respected and heard. As the weeks turned into months, Joseph and Mark's partnership continued to grow stronger. They met regularly to discuss the progress of the police reform initiative and to brainstorm new ideas for improving community police relations. One sunny afternoon, Joseph invited Mark to his office at the state capitol. As Mark entered, he couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at how far he'd come since that fateful night. Mark, I'm glad you could make it, Joseph said warmly, gesturing for him to take a seat. I've been thinking about our next steps. Mark nodded eagerly. I'm all ears, Governor. Joseph leaned forward, his eyes bright with enthusiasm. I believe it's time we push for some real policy changes within the police department. Mandatory bias training for all officers should be our top priority. I couldn't agree more, Mark replied. The training I went through changed my life. Every officer should have that opportunity. Together, they pored over documents and statistics, crafting a proposal that would require all officers in the state to undergo comprehensive bias training. They worked tirelessly, reaching out to community leaders, police chiefs, and lawmakers to gather support for their initiative. Their efforts didn't go unnoticed. As word spread about their proposed reforms, more and more people rallied behind their cause. Joseph and Mark found themselves speaking at community events, police academies, and even national conferences, sharing their story and advocating for change. The road wasn't always smooth. They faced resistance from some who feared change or didn't see the need for reform. But Joseph and Mark remained steadfast in their commitment, supporting each other through the challenges. Their persistence paid off. After months of hard work, the state legislature passed a bill mandating bias training for all police officers. It was a significant victory, but Joseph and Mark knew it was just the beginning. As they stood together at the press conference announcing the new law, Joseph placed a hand on Mark's shoulder. We've come a long way, my friend, he said softly. Mark nodded, his eyes misting over with emotion. And we've still got a long way to go. But together... I believe we can make a real difference. As the new policies took effect, Mark found himself in a unique position within the police department. His transformation from a biased officer to a champion of change had not gone unnoticed by his colleagues. Initially, some officers were skeptical of Mark's new approach, but as they witnessed the positive impact of his changed behavior, their attitudes began to shift. One day during a shift briefing, a young officer named Maria approached Mark. Officer Tanner, she said hesitantly, I've been watching how you interact with the community. It's different, in a good way. Could you maybe show me how you do it? Mark smiled warmly. Of course, Maria, I'd be happy to. From that moment on, Mark became a mentor to Maria and other younger officers who were eager to learn. He took them on ride-alongs, demonstrating how to approach situations with empathy and respect. Mark shared his own experiences, including his mistakes, to help the younger officers understand the importance of treating everyone with dignity. Remember, Mark would often say, every person we encounter has a story. Our job is to listen and understand before we act. As weeks passed, the department began to see a noticeable change. Officers who had once been quick to judge were now taking the time to listen. Community complaints decreased, and positive interactions increased. The cultural shift towards empathy and inclusivity was slow but steady. During a community outreach event, Mark overheard two veteran officers discussing the changes. You know, I was skeptical at first, one said, but I've got to admit, Tanner's approach is making a difference. I feel like I'm actually helping people now not just enforcing laws. The other nodded in agreement. Yeah, it's like we're part of the community now, not just policing it. Mark felt a surge of pride hearing these words. He knew there was still work to be done, but the progress was undeniable. The department was becoming a place where compassion and respect were valued as much as bravery and dedication. As news of the initiative's success spread, other states began to take notice. 
The program that had started with a chance encounter between Joseph and Mark was now gaining national attention. Police departments across the country were reaching out, eager to learn how they could implement similar changes in their own communities. Mark and Joseph found themselves in high demand. They were invited to speak at national law enforcement conferences, sharing their story and the valuable lessons they had learned. At one such conference in Chicago, Mark stood before a packed auditorium of police officers and administrators from across the country. A few years ago, I was part of the problem, Mark began, his voice steady and sincere. My biases led me to make a terrible mistake, but thanks to Governor Thompson's forgiveness and guidance, I was given a chance to change. Joseph joined Mark on stage, placing a supportive hand on his shoulder. What Officer Tanner and I have learned, Joseph added, is that true change comes from within. It requires honesty, humility, and a willingness to confront our own prejudices. As they spoke, the audience listened intently. Many nodded in recognition of their own experiences, while others scribbled notes furiously. The impact of their words was palpable. After the conference, several police chiefs approached Mark and Joseph, eager to discuss how they could bring similar programs to their own departments. One chief from Texas said, What you've done in your state is incredible. We need this kind of change everywhere. In the months that followed, Mark and Joseph found themselves traveling across the country, conducting workshops and helping other states set up their own initiatives. They worked tirelessly, sharing their experiences and providing guidance on how to implement effective bias training and community outreach programs. The message of unity and understanding that had begun in their home state was now spreading far and wide. Law enforcement practices were slowly but surely being influenced by their story of redemption and transformation. As more departments adopted these new approaches, positive changes began to ripple through communities nationwide. As Mark sat in his hotel room after another successful workshop, he found himself lost in thought. The past few years had been a whirlwind of change, and he couldn't help but marvel at the journey that had brought him to this point. He remembered the night he had arrested Joseph, thinking back to the anger and suspicion that had clouded his judgment. The shame of that moment still stung, but it no longer paralyzed him. Instead, it served as a constant reminder of why his work was so important. Mark picked up a framed photo from his nightstand. It was a picture of him and Joseph at the launch of their first statewide training program. The smiles on their faces spoke volumes about the hope and determination they shared. I've come so far, Mark whispered to himself, but there's still so much work to do. He knew that his transformation wasn't complete. Every day brought new challenges and opportunities for growth. Just last week, he had caught himself making a snap judgment about a young man in a hoodie. But this time, he had recognized his bias and consciously chosen to approach the situation with an open mind. Mark felt a swell of pride as he thought about the officers he had trained. Many of them had shared stories of how the program had changed their approach to policing. Some had even become trainers themselves, spreading the message of empathy and understanding to their own departments. As he prepared for bed, Mark reflected on the words of a young officer he had spoken to earlier that day. You've shown us that it's okay to admit we're not perfect, the officer had said, and that we can always strive to be better. Those words resonated deeply with Mark. He knew that his journey was far from over, but he was committed to continuing his growth and helping others do the same. With a sense of purpose and determination, Mark closed his eyes, ready to face whatever challenges tomorrow might bring. The sun shone brightly on the community park as people from all walks of life gathered for a special celebration. Colorful banners fluttered in the gentle breeze, announcing the success of the police community initiative Laughter and cheerful chatter filled the air as children played on the grass, and adults mingled, sharing stories and smiles. Mark stood beside Joseph at the edge of the crowd, taking in the scene before them. His heart swelled with emotion as he watched officers in uniform chatting easily with community members, their faces open and friendly. It was a far cry from the tense, distrustful atmosphere that had once existed between law enforcement and the public. Can you believe how far we've come? Joseph asked, his voice filled with wonder. Mark shook his head, still amazed at the transformation. It's incredible, 
he replied softly. I never thought I'd see anything like this. As they watched, a young girl approached a police officer offering him a flower. The officer knelt down, accepting the gift with a warm smile. The girl's mother looked on, her eyes shining with tears of joy. Mark felt a lump form in his throat. He remembered a time when such a scene would have been unthinkable. Now, it was becoming the norm. Joseph placed a hand on Mark's shoulder. You should be proud, Mark. You've played a big part in making this happen. Mark nodded, unable to speak for a moment. When he found his voice, it was thick with emotion. I'm just grateful for the chance to make things right. To be a part of something so much bigger than myself. As they made their way through the crowd, people stopped to greet them, sharing words of thanks and encouragement. Mark was struck by the genuine warmth in their eyes, the trust that had replaced fear and suspicion. Standing at the center of it all, Mark felt a deep sense of fulfillment wash over him. He had come so far from that night when his prejudices had nearly ruined everything. Now, he was part of creating a world where understanding and compassion prevailed. If you enjoyed the story of Joseph and Mark, I handpicked this next story that will touch your heart. Please don't miss this one. Click here to watch it.